I'm Richard Dodd, and you're listening to the Ecology Academy podcast. This is a show where we get to talk and learn about all things ecological, including interviews with top ecologists, both employers and employees, those working with ecologists, and also aspiring and inspiring career-seeking individuals setting out to make a difference. The show aims to provide you with insights, advice, and inspiration to help you succeed and excel as an effective ecologist and to make a real difference to our natural environment. Career exploitation refers to situations in which an employer or work environment takes advantage of an employee for their own benefit, often at the expense of the employee's well-being and long-term career prospects. This can take many forms, such as paying employees less than they deserve, not providing adequate opportunities for growth and development, or assigning them work that is outside of their job description or skill set. Furthermore, career exploitation can lead to feelings of burnout, job dissatisfaction, and a lack of motivation to continue working in a particular field. It can also limit an employee's future career opportunities by not providing the necessary skills and experience to advance to higher level positions. So how can early career ecologists with maybe only a limited knowledge of the work of an ecological or environmental company identify the signs of exploitation and it found what to do about it? Well, helping us understand this topic is my guest today on the Ecology Academy podcast, Paul Whitby from the Ecology Co-op. So, Paul, welcome. Welcome. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, not a problem. So, how are you doing? Yeah, all good, thank you. Yeah, uh, enjoying some sunshine for a change. Excellent. Oh, yeah, we we um, we our office is based close to a river, and um, it is finally abated now after about um, that deluge we had. I think it was in uh, mid uh, mid January. It was. I think across the whole of the UK, wasn't it? Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, welcome to the Ecology Cad uh, podcast itself. So, Paul, uh, before we start, um, perhaps we could introduce you. Yeah, well, I'll let you introduce yourself and yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into ecology, and um, and a bit, and of course about the wonderful work you do at the Ecology Co-op. Well, my my background in ecology, like a lot of people, I guess that that are now in the field of ecology, I was a big lover of David Attenborough growing up. Um, you know, it's one of my earliest things I can remember is being really excited, sat on on the carpet in front of the TV because life on Earth was about to start. Uh, with that that big sun, do you remember that with the dramatic sort of orchestral music? Oh yes. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's partly where it uh, it spawned from. But I, I grew up in the countryside, and and you know my hobbies were finding slow worms and looking for tadpoles in ponds, like a lot of other countryside kids um, back in the in the early eighties, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I started my career at uh, RSK up in um, in near Chester. Uh, they got an office in in Hull. Worked for them for a couple of years. Uh, with my brother for a bit, who's also an ecologist. Obviously, it runs in the family. And um, when the the recession hit in two thousand and nine, I um, ended up working, you know, as a subcontractor for a while, set up as a sole trader, and that eventually sort of spawned and grew quite organically into a consultancy that I now run, which is um, about about eighteen to twenty people. I think it'd be twenty by the end of next month. <laughs> Just recruiting at the moment. Oh yes, yes, the recruitment rounds. Yes, yes, absolutely. yeah. So, um, who are you looking for? What um, sort of levels are you looking for in terms of your recruitment round this time? Uh, we've got a senior joining us uh, next month, which I'm really excited about. Um, they're hard to come by, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and we've got uh, an assistant ecologist joining uh, our team in, in Kent as well. And and they're someone who subcontracted with us um, for, for a bit last year. So, you know, it's really great when you get that opportunity to work with someone before you um, before they start with you. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I think it's, um, you know, it, it's uh, I think it gives them reassurance as well as, uh, I suppose, you, you know, you as the employer also reassurance as well that that's, uh, you know, how trainable it, it maybe someone is as well. Yeah, it works both ways, doesn't it? You, you get confidence in, in each other and, and get to know about each other. Great. Yeah. OK, so a little bit more about the Ecology Co-op then. So you said about um, you got about, say, 18 to 20 employees um, within the company itself. Um, whereabouts are you based? So we've got two offices, uh, one in West Sussex, a little, little town there called uh, called Petworth, uh, which is where I grew up. And we've got uh, another office over in, in Kent, which is just near Folkestone, uh, run by my colleague Dan. Excellent, excellent. And we obviously you mentioned about recruitment there. So um, in terms of your structure, then you got to I say, you know, you're well done for getting a senior um, uh, to, to join your company. As I say, it's, it's a very difficult to do. Um, in terms of your 
a mix of ecologists then. So, I mean, do you employ, what, what, what sort of ecologists do you employ? Yeah, so there's myself and Dan who are the, the two principals. We've got two associates who are effectively work freelance, but they have kind of shares in the company. We've got this kind of social structure to the, the company. Um, they're both principals and, and help us mostly on um, bat work. Uh, we've then got uh, four seniors, uh, a fifth to, to join soon, who's actually going to be sort of progressing up to, to senior. Uh, we've then got three consultants and uh Ooh, let me think four assistants at the moment i think yeah four assistants excellent excellent <laughs> and then of course you know some admin admin stuff as well to, to help out with with various bits and pieces of course yeah and um in terms of then i suppose like you, you know your recruitment what you see because i think i mean the reason why we're talking about exploitation within the ecological well, let's say consultancy sector but i suppose it's any career really but um let's focus upon ecology because it's something we know about uh, as uh, being owners of uh, an ecological consultancy um in terms of your experience or frustration or you know because you've just written you or you've you know you, you wrote um maybe was it last year something about exploitation in the industry so perhaps you could talk us through why you wrote that and um you know what your definition perhaps is of um, exploitation yeah sure i mean I, th- I think personally i've been quite lucky um you know i've i've not been uh, exposed to the worst of it uh, I, I think certainly practices as they were when I started, you know, my, my career is, I'm 17 years in now. And when I started, um, you know, working practices in, in every sector probably were a bit worse and, and a bit harder. And it's 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 right and just they should be progressing to becoming fairer, safer, uh, you know, to the benefit of, of employees in particular. Um but I've, I've certainly along the way, I've, I've, I've spoken to, you know, colleagues that have worked elsewhere. I've interviewed uh, a lot of people that have, have had placements or, or, or worked sort of seasonally at other um, consultancies. And, and they've told me about, you know, some practices which, which unfortunately are just, just unacceptable. Um, you know, working exceptionally long hours, being given very little um, sleep, uh, often traveling, you know, not a few hours a day, but driving on the road for eight or nine hours a day. Um, you, you know, th- things that we, we shouldn't be doing if we're if we're we're thinking about the welfare of the people that we're employing, um, their well-being and, uh, and and a whole bunch of health and safety that comes with that, because, mm, sure. you, you know, ecology is is work that. You know, a lot of it is it as, as unsociable hours. It's early in the morning, it's late in the evening, and, it, you know, people can get tired, and with that, there comes a risk. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, in terms of what, you know, uh, so what prompted you, what drove you to actually write that article then, you know, um, uh, Paul? Yeah, quite a lot of, of the focus on, on the article was about how we need to be supporting uh, early career ecologists progressing uh, to becoming the next consultants, the next seniors and principals, because there is a problem with the shortage of of, of those grades in, in in consultancy, and unfortunately, it is because I think a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of graduates coming in or people changing career and coming into ecology. Um, they have an expectation of of you know being able to work outside in a good environment, um, you know, working with wildlife. Everyone, loads of people want to do it. Um, but the reality often is, unfortunately, a, a, you know, met with a, a lack of training, uh, a lack of development, uh, you know, a lack of support um, generally and, and being asked to work, you know, unreasonable hours at times. So um, I think that that's why the industry is struggling. And, and the focus of, of the article I wrote was looking at training and having training targets as a means of supporting the professional development of uh, early career ecologists, because I think that. You know, the consultancy is tough. Yeah. Um, you know, it is hard work, and 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 certainly, you know, it, it's it's not for the faint-hearted. But um, but I think I think that you'll get more more people progressing if they if they feel that they're being given the support necessary to grow into the role. You need to grow in confidence. You need to develop those survey skills, the report writing skills and everything with it. What you don't want is to be taken on a six month contract, stuck on a reptile translocation for all six months, <laughs> come away with it. And all you've learned is how to sex and identify repti- common reptiles, which it, it does very little in terms of career progression. You need a more wholesome experience that is, that is teaching you, you know, everything about consultancy and what is required uh, decision-making skills, impact mm. assessment—you know that—that is—that is what we need. 
Okay, yeah, no, it's interesting. So, I mean, I, I suppose I, I, I'm going to add in a little bit about um, ourselves as well and also what I see as uh, exploitation. And I, I suppose I'm going to take it back to sort of, sort of the definition of, of my, well, it's my definition or understanding of exploitation, and we can have a discussion about that. So I think in terms of, I think you've introduced it already, you know, said, you know, why do people go into a career as an agriculture consultant? And it gives you, let's say, it's, it's something they find they're passionate about, you know, they're passionate about the, the natural world, the environment, wanting to mm-hmm. make a difference. Um, and why choose ecological consultancy for that? Well, it may give them flexibility, you know, in terms of, um, you know, there's some consultancies out there that which will clearly, you know, flexibility is definitely one of the, uh, the the top values of a company, isn't it? I mean, you know, offering, you know, work from home and work from anywhere um, situations. There's the potential for career growth, as you said, through training and development. You know, they want to want to learn more and to be more effective and work towards their own, you know, their, I say that, that passion they have. Um, possibly, you know, people think about obviously job security. You know, if you get a job, they can get move on throughout the rest of their life as well. Get that house, get the things they want, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, live a more comfortable life, shall we say? And we talked about values, aligning with their own personal values, as I say about them, working towards that green recovery, and maybe even on a personal level. So, you know, I think there's, we, you know, you mentioned those, uh, you know, elements about why people go into ecological work themselves. So I suppose e- any of those could potentially be exploited, you know, and I think there's, you know, as far as my understanding is, you know, exploitation can, you know, it's one of those mismatches, you know, it's like something, if so, you know, you may hold um, hard work as an extreme value, I mean, not extreme, value, but a value, you know, hard work, dedication, I'm willing to put in the hours in, and that is one of my values, you know, dedication to the subject. And, you know, you've mentioned here about traveling from, you know, across the country, you know, multiple hours. Now, I'm, I'm trying to sort of play a little devil's advocate here, but, um, you know, if that's someone's value, actually, I don't mind the long hours. Is that exploitation? Yeah, there, there, there's there's all sorts of considerations of that, isn't there? Because, I mean, yeah, if you're if you're working in, in um you know, with with bats, for example, it might be that you want to do, you know, a lot of these dusk and dawn surveys mm. and you want to rack them up. You want to be out there getting that exposure um, and knowing your limits is important. But also you've got a responsibility as an employer to make sure that you are taking care of the well-being of your employee, even if they believe they are pursuing their own ambition and their own desires, mm. because you, cause you, you have to have... You, like me, you, you probably have a lot of work to do in terms of um, setting up health and safety policies and setting those parameters for what you think are safe working conditions. Um, and, you, you know, for me, if, if if I had a job that was, you know, someone having to drive four and a half hours, uh, you know, up to, to, to Wales, let's say, for a survey and then expect them to drive all the way back again for, for a nine hour round trip, I'd be having alarm bells of that's that's an awful lot of driving for someone who's not a lorry driver you know um and so even if they really wanted to do that and and they say that they don't want to have to stay at a hotel or whatever you've got to have your your red lines and make sure that you're fulfilling your responsibilities as an employer okay yep excellent so you know so what we're talking about here is then that um you know the the employee may have their own um set of I say standards, the value, the reasons why they're coming to work for yourself, for someone like yourself, then Paul. Um, mm. But equally so, they have, you know, you have a responsibility as an employer uh, to ensure that they are maybe, you know, I mean, some people, I know some companies, they encourage their employees. If not, it's it's maybe in the contract to opt out of maybe the work time directive, for instance, or that mm. you know, or previously have have done. Um, you know, or it's a clear expectation right from the very start, maybe not the job advert, um, mm-hmm. or it could be the job advert, but equally so at interview stage, that, you know, the, the interviewee, the interviewers could be saying, look, this is a very labor intensive job. You'll be working long hours. I mean, in one way, preempting it and actually putting p- words in people's mouth by saying, are you prepared to work long hours? So, yeah. the, you know, so and the clause in the interview, you're probably going to say yes, aren't you? <laughs> well, well, more than likely, yeah. Roger. It's yeah. I mean, we're still going to be careful that there's, of course, you know, there's legislation in place. You know, you no one should be required to work uh, more than forty eight hours a week on a on a, an average basis. Um, uh, and so, you, I I think there are ways that certain, you know, companies might 
be trying to get around this uh, to some degree, but um, but but you, because it's not, for example, officially on a timesheet. Um, but but you you've got to be very careful. And uh, and I think I think you know the, the point is that yes, the focus is certainly mostly on the the well being of the employee, making sure that they're working what they're happy with. But also, you can create an unrealistic expectation that you know person X is is oh well, look they did fifty five hours last week they're they're still all guns blazing ready to go that doesn't mean person y should have the same expectations of them so that you know this is again part of the reason why we've got to have those those parameters that safety zone that you work within yeah absolutely and i think that's uh, one i think what's one of the key areas isn't it that um, you know just, as you say one person a may love working those hours person a may also enjoy um you know just dedicating on <laughs> you mentioned about those the, maybe slow worm translocations you know they may just want want to be a slow worm translocator for the rest of their lives and, yeah. and doing that is not exploitation because they're getting something from it they're benefiting from some, something from it mm. but i suppose what we're alluding to now is the fact that uh, okay that may not be everything that that person desires and person b for instance may enjoy doing a little bit of <laughs> Uh, slow worm translocation and may occasionally um you know be expected to undertake longer hours than usual but it's, but certainly not the the normal practice for them mm. exactly yeah. yeah so um in terms of um so you mentioned about um so i mean that, that that's my sort of t- i mean sort of take on exploitation is that is that something that um you well an individual will have many reasons for choosing a company and um you know i suppose exploitation is if it goes against what they believe or stand for or stand against maybe that is maybe that's something that that, that you know they should be addressing um or looking out for should we say uh, um it's, let, let's look at um in terms of early career ecologists then so it's, it was one of these things it's great to be aware of these issues but what happens if you're fresh out of university or fresh out of doing a, a bit of training? You know, if you're uh, you know changing careers, for instance, how, how do you know? How do you know what? How do you know what to look out for? Yeah, it's not straightforward, is it? You, because you can't know everything about all the choice of of different consultancies out there, and that there is a big wide choice. Um, I think that there tends to be a focus. Uh, by a lot of early career ecologists to try and go straight for one of the biggest consultancies they can find because I think you know there's a draw perhaps of working on large projects they think about the possible diversity of work that might be involved in in working for a larger consultancy but it's it's worth doing your you know your background checks and actually trying to see if you can spot the projects that they work on because it like I said it, it might be that actually it's it's on the Isle of Grain and actually it's you know it is going to be a reptile translocation for the whole summer um so I, I think you can look up on every any company's website. You can look through the projects that they work on. Hopefully they've got, you know, a, a fair bit of information about who is in their team, about the work they undertake um, and, and you know, the protected species they work with. Some consultancies will just focus on bats. You know, some will, will just work mostly on uh, riparian habitats and, and so on. So it, 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 doing your, your, your background checks is, is definitely worthwhile. Yeah, and, and and why do you think this is a? I mean, you mentioned at the start about um, the knock-on effects in terms of um, you know running, you know, from advancing people's careers. So that career development, should we say, you know, that um, people get a bad taste of what an ecological consultancy is like and assume perhaps, or you know, uh, that all consultancies are exactly the same. So, um, I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is that your take on things, or um, you know, what, what are the risks of exploitation um, uh, within our industry? I, I, you know, I, there's, 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 yeah, there's obviously a big wide range of different types of consultancies with different practices, different um, working conditions. You know, <clears throat> I've read about a lot. of Several who have posted, say, you know, on, on forums, et cetera, saying that they no longer will do more than two bat emergent surveys a week, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I would regularly in the past do four myself. We now do three as a maximum. So it's three on sociable hours shifts maximum in a week. Um, you you can do your best to try and find out what their their practices are. But I, th- I think a little bit you don't know until perhaps you you get the opportunity to talk to them which is then comes on to your interview stage being prepped with the right questions 
And I, I love it when people ask questions in, in, in an interview because it shows that they're engaging and it shows that they've really thought about what they want their career to be. So it, it do definitely, if you're listening to this, you know, and, and you're you're an early career ecologist and, and you're looking to interview for a job soon, go armed with some questions. Ask, you, you know, how many surveys are you expected to do a week? Are you expected to stay away from home? How far away typically are the sites that you've got to drive to? And if they're being honest, hopefully you'll you'll get a realistic picture of 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 what you should expect moving forward. And it, it might be for you. It might be that if you've got a few interviews lined up, you can pick and choose. Possibly, if you're lucky, you know the the consultancy you want based on on what they're offering. Okay, great, thank you. And in terms of um, now, I'm going to do a bit, a bit of role play with you now. Now, Paul, <laughs> imagine that you are not the ecology cop. You know, a good ecology consultancy. Okay, and you are deliberately going out your way because you know to you to the, your company profit is absolutely everything absolutely everything it's the bottom line without profit you as a shareholder are not getting anything okay so you know you've got your vested interest at heart here so it's like I say something that goes against what you do personally I, mean, I know but, I'm uh, Mr. Capitalist you're yeah. Mr. Capitalist exactly <laughs> okay so what unscrupulous methods could you employ then to lure uh, a potential ecologist to your company uh, and how could you squeeze the most out of them in order to get the profits? I, I see some classic approaches with this and a lot of it is to do with um, anticipated working hours versus real working hours. Um, some consultancies will give you, uh, you know, timesheets to fill out each week and they'll tell you that you've got to hit a certain target of chargeable worked hours every week. Um if you if you don't hit those target hours and and in some cases they might be it might be 95% of your week it might be 100% of your week that has to be chargeable time uh if you don't hit those hours you're you're getting a slap on the wrist you know you you're the, the pressure is applied to you um so i might advertise myself to them as you know okay you, you're, you're on a 40 hour week contract and and you'll be working on various projects and sign along the dotted line but in reality there's all sorts of various administrative tasks that you have to do there's emails you have to reply to there's filling out the timesheet itself uh there's trying to fit in training you're being asked to write up a presentation you've been asked to do an extra survey but you've already filled out your hours but it's it's a survey you really want to do because you've not been on about emergent survey yet so you end up going along and doing it anyway and you're not being paid for your time because you're fixed at 40 hours this kind of little cheats in there that that I know have happened and and, and can happen um, that that you know means that companies are profiting off you and and you've got to make sure that you are paid for the time you're working mm -hmm. and that's regardless of whether it's chargeable or whether it's training or whether it's admin or, or anything else. Okay, okay. So you mentioned about there about um, you know you, you know not, not getting paid for certain work. You know it's, it's, mm. you fill your time sheet and it's completed. Let's talk about pay then. Um, so you, as a um, you know um, a capitalist ecologist, uh, now are employing someone. So I mean, yeah. What what what's I mean? Do you think there should be a, a minimum set value for a particular role, for instance, or do you think actually the market should decide? That's a tough one, is it? Because it, the, the market, I mean, the, unfortunately, you know, with the level of hate capitalism, the market does decide the rate to some degree. And I think that, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. To, and hopefully a lot of employees are now looking at, at what they have been paying and they are trying to pull, you know, expectations up a bit because, I mean, ecology salaries have been very poor in the past. You know, it, it's not that long ago I've seen jobs advertised for sort of, 16,000 quid for for an assistant ecologist you know full-time uh, contract um and, and fortunately now you're very you very rarely you do a little sometimes but you don't often see them below sort of 1920 um and they should be a bit a bit higher than that if you can if you can afford it and when you're starting out small i can understand why you know um some people struggle with their first employee to 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 match um you know seller expectations but um yes i i think the the market does decide the rate, but but yeah, if you're a conscientious employer, and I'm, I know in this role I'm not, I'm Mr. Capitalist. Uh, you you should just be considering what what is a fair rate. But but at the end of the day, you you've got a, a field of, of potential candidates. There's there's a generally tends to be more early career ecologists applying for jobs than there are available. Yeah. 
on the whole and that has led to to you know some very cheap um some very low salaries um the the only way to change that is is i don't know but it's it's changing mindsets it's hopefully getting people to realize that they need to to increase their own expectations um and maybe it's there is other means out there that that could be looked at in the future you know whether maybe ecology sector needs a union you know <laughs> maybe maybe it does uh yeah. it's it's a growing industry so mm-hmm. um so why not consider that option okay so um let's say again you are your your capital capitalist ecologist as well now you recognize that okay to lure people in again okay you you know you want to attract you want to you want to get them the most ecology you've got a big contract coming up you need to get 30 to 40 of uh, assistant ecologists in okay um now to beat the competition you're going to raise your price as, as in your pay you know you're going to pay some really good salaries now you're going to lure these people in get them in because you need that you need you need those to fill out those those contracts that you've had for the past x amount of months or years and something so um pay's not problem pay's really really good so everything should be fine shouldn't it Am I still Mr. Capitalist in this role? Yes. <laughs> I hate being this guy. <laughs> I <know>. um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, you, you. I mean, at the end of the day, there are contracts out there where assistant ecologist charge out rates will be way sky high above what you can realistically, uh, you know, above what uh, you're, you're paying someone. So you, there's a huge fat commission on there, and you could afford. Yeah, you could afford to pay an awful lot more. If you're being Mr. Capitalist about it, you'd drag them in with a higher salary. You'd give them, you know, the minimum training required to fulfill the duty of that task. Let's say, again, it's, it's you know, it's a whopping great big reptile translocation somewhere. So you give them uh, a few days training on, on identification of common reptiles and how to handle them and put them into a, a bucket or a cloth bag and take them the other side of a fence. Um, and then that's it. You set them out. You set them out to pasture to to do that work. And and then at the end of the contract, your only cost is that training time. You've you've got you know their salary to pay for, but you've obviously made a huge, great big wedge on on top with that uh, that contract. And uh, you're doing very nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now you can revert back to your you know, to, to good to good Paul now if you like it as well. But uh, excellent. Uh, yeah. There you go. I can see. You, yeah. Yeah. It's something that doesn't for, for, uh, form naturally. So um, okay. So you know we looked at a bit about pay there. We looked at also about um, as I say about maybe the training and development of because you, you're clearly quite passionate about the training and development of um, you know ecologists as a whole and making sure they are. Uh, you know, I've got a good grounding in all aspects of, you know, many aspects of ecology, should we say. So, um, okay, so we've got pay rise. We've got, um, I say, we've got a good range of ecological skills and, a bit, a bit, you know, training and development going on there. Um, but w- what else could um, potentially trip up an employer or, 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 or should we say, fall foul of um, you know, exploitation? inside inside typically more better working practices yeah so um, yeah so yeah yeah i i think I th- yeah I, you you can be have too much put on top of you you know before you're ready particularly is the pressure comes forward at the, at the moment as we're seeing in that we've got consultants and assistants with, with employees desperately trying to push them up the ladder because they can't recruit, they can't find seniors, they can't find principals, and so, you know, they're pushing them into roles for which they're not they're not prepared and they're not ready, mm. um, and and that can be really challenging if you're if you're pushed into a level of management that you're not prepared for, you know, you're you're dealing with a high profile client and some clients in in consultancy can be dreadful. <laughs> I've, I'm sure we've both had them, uh, literally shouty, shouty down the phone types, um, and yeah, you, 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 that can overwhelm someone pretty quickly if if they're, if they're not prepared for for that role and and, and dealing with those types of people. God, yeah, absolutely, and no, I, I totally agree with you. I think that's um, you know pushing people, and I'm you know I've seen it that um, you know we probably not just ourselves. I'm sure there's many other ecological consultants out there who struggle to recruit those senior people because other ecological consultancies have promoted their their staff and who's not going to accept a promotion who's not going to accept a promotion who's not going to accept a pay rise well, well most people aren't going to you know are going to go with that at all you know with that but you're right it does come at a particular cost if that person has been put into a position where they are a unfamiliar with the work 
mm. not comfortable doing the work, have not been trained or supported in it, and particularly in leading maybe a team. Um, higher, as you say, though those those projects that may require a, a lot more demanding. It, it may be more time, but it's certainly a lot more sort of. Um, yeah, conflict management and, and conflict resolution and uh, communication skills. And as we you know, ecologists are a brilliant bunch of people, else we wouldn't be doing it. You know, we're brilliant. We're, you know, we're fantastic. We're very passionate about what we do. And we're passionate on the technical aspects of what we do. And sometimes, you know, you do find those rare people and, and hold on to them if you've got them. You know, those people who can do both the technical you know, technical um, operational skills, deliberate, you know, going out and doing the site work and also inspiring, managing, leading teams and taking on responsibility. But some people just don't want to do that, do they? No, you're right. I'm glad you kind of mentioned just then that uh, it, it's a point that most ecologists are really good because possibly for the dialogue so far has made it sound like there's an awful lot of bad people out there, mm, but mm. actually is a very small minority. It's just that I think we, we, we should you know, always be striving for protect, perfect, uh, perfection. Sorry, get it out properly. Perfection in the, you know, in our industry and the best practices that we can. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, I'm sorry. I've lost <laughs> coming out with that. I've forgotten what you asked me now. No, no, yeah, it is. It is about, uh, yeah, that career growth. You know, you put, you've been put in a position where, you know, you, you are, I suppose, set up to fail really because you want to do your ecology but you're, yeah. you're being tasked to do management. And perhaps that's something that, uh, you know, it may be you'll, be you'll be you'll be good at it, but you haven't been given the tools to help you develop, you know, that particular skill set. It's it's something I've struggled with, you know, because it, it, I came into ecology with a love of a love of wildlife, you know, and as you as you go up in seniority, you just find yourself more and more and more behind a desk um, in more and more and more around a, a you know, board meeting table, looking at a master plan for a, a big development with with a bunch of architects mm -hmm. and stuff, and um, you, you know, you you start to feel that you, those skills that you work so hard to 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 develop are starting to slip on you a little bit. But it's I, I do come across a lot of people who find that conflict, and and yes, they might be good at management, but it's always the the what's always drawing them back is is what originally drew them into ecology it is being out in the field and honing those botanical skills that that they fell in love with and and getting out and seeing bats in roosts and and monitoring badger sets and finding dormice and everything else that comes with the wonderful wide spectrum of 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 the you know the field of work that we love and enjoy yeah so exploitation basically uh, i think we're um you're saying is that it it may it may be more pronounced at maybe the early career stage, but because there's a little bit of naivety, you know, you're going to be undertaking skill. You know, there's one of those it's those unknown unknowns, isn't it? You don't know mm. that you're being exploited if you don't know about it. You know, about um, you know pay, time, uh, training, development, and so forth, and working conditions, and so yeah, yeah. Um, but equally so. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it can Upper carry on. Too. It can carry on yeah. in your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you get drawn into a, a kind of a corporate lifestyle that that is 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 not what you what you want, and and you know it, with that comes obviously an awful lot of pressure and, and a very different kind of environment to, to the one you probably were used to when you were working as a, an assistant or a consultant sort of developing. And bad outcomes for not only for the individual, but for the company. Uh, and Absolutely. also for obviously, you know, we're working towards that, um, you know, that, that gr I say green recovery, you know, that's, uh, you know, some positive outcomes for, for, for nature. And, um, you know, if we're not mm. doing that, say, you know, if we can't do that justice, you know, for good employees, you know, good, mm. you know, Good managers, good leaders, good ecologists. You know, you need you need everyone on board yeah. in order to yeah. achieve those. Um, and that okay. can, that can, I was going to say that mm. that can happen certainly with specific projects as well. So, I've, I've I mean I've 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 never worked on HS two, but I've I've talked to plenty of people who have, and and have talked about the pressure in, involved in it because of how public it is. Yeah. You know. And, you know, that that's, that's not just on site. That's when they get home and people they speak to when they find out they've worked on it. You know what I mean? There's there's because it's such a hot potato politically um, and environmentally. Yeah. Uh, it's it, it comes with an awful lot of pressure. And, and uh, I imagine that it, 
well it, it has been very hard on a lot of ecologists that worked on that project it is, yeah i think um you know uh, you know hey just do all you know uh, other projects as well you know it could even be the, the, the number of projects you have yeah um in terms of you know that that that's um, a feeling of um, being burnt out you know, you know yeah you've got, you've got that um, you know you, your own well-being you know it's not taken into consideration so I think, you know, we, we, we people talk about um, a work-life balance and, um, you know, th- there are moments within everyone's lives where they'll be working more than they would do normally. But equally so, good employers should also recognise that, um, uh, you know, there is a time for personal endeavours to also take over. You know, so, so your personal life, your working life, you know, they're both interwoven, but none should be... You know, you know, there's, there's, there, there are going to be periods of, you know, peaks and troughs in both of those. I mean, after, I don't think it's going to be a perfect balance because, you know, as soon as you start to balance things, it becomes imbalanced. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of, okay, that's that's we're looking about, you know, early promotion just to keep people on board. Um, but um, I, I'm sure there's also exploitation of actually keeping employees within a particular pay band as well because strangely enough they haven't quite hit their personal you know their annual appraisals um and um i mean i'm I'm sorry you know uh, sorry madeline unfortunately you know you won't be promoted this year because you haven't reached these particular targets which i've given you very vague (laughs) very (laughs) vague uh, sort of um um guidelines to yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, just, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't resonate with the ecology Corp, but, um, it, you know, how can we overcome this then, Paul, do you think? Well, it's certainly if you've, if you've been in consultancy for at least two years, I think that you're already at a point where your horizon's open. You know, your ability to, to find work elsewhere will, will, will come much more easily because you've gone past that kind of first early, early career uh, step you know um and, and i think you know with two years on 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 the clock you've you, you're developing towards a consultant and by then the demand is starting to to grow for for you so i think i think you know you should start look to yourself start looking at your own value and your ability mm-hmm. to negotiate which is is very um it's very individual some people are are very comfortable and happy just coming straight out with this is what i want these are my terms you know i'm demanding this um other people you know, and I, I obviously have done appraisals a long time. A lot of people, other people, very much sit back and like to be told, uh, you know, what what my opinion is of them and how they performed and and what they're worth. So um, I think I think uh, yeah, I'd encourage people to maybe just look look at, look across you know the ecology sector, look at what's being advertised, um, and and think about what they might be able to get you know, elsewhere? Is it in a role similar to theirs? You know, don't, don't look, if you work at the moment in a, a, an SME, it's probably not best not to compare directly with a whopping great mm-hmm. big multinational consultancy. It'd be a very different thing and, and the two shouldn't really be compared. But um, but but do look at what's being paid elsewhere and be prepared to go forward and, and ask for that. Yeah, and I think um, if I'm going to add a little bit to that, it, it's... Um... We we know that there's a lot of jobs advertised. You know, there's a lot mm. of job, jobs advertised, especially at certain times of the year, because obviously you know, it comes to be the start of the season. Other jobs are advertised because uh, maybe a person's left. You need to, you know, just to fill a role. Now, equally so, and I don't know about how you find this, but you know, I, I certainly, you know, uh, welcome sort of in unsolicited sort of approaches, really, because, you know, it, it, we may not have a position at that moment in time, um, but there may be, uh, but there could be opportunities maybe in a couple of months, you know, t- uh, times for it to actually offer that, that person a, 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 um, a, like a role. But equally so, if we find someone who has demonstrated some really good skills that, do you know what? Okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a punt on this person because, uh, you know, uh, okay, they, they, they may not have any licenses, but I'll tell you what they have, you know, they've shown pro, you know, they're, they're proactive. They are, you know, they're demonstrating some good, really managerial skills. Those soft skills that we keep saying, I don't, I don't know why they call them soft skills because um, I think they're probably <laughs> interpersonal pretty hard. Skills. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. They're hard to come by. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So in terms of, uh, I, I suppose my question to you, Paul, is, um, you know, 
you know, as well as in your armory, uh, people are going to sort of um, develop some sort of strategy, maybe to avoid exploitation. Um, you know, it's knowing when you're in a toxic environment and when to p possibly jump ship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and 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 there are a lot of jobs out there. So, so like like you said, you you look at the at the market at the moment that everyone's advertising. That there's there's jobs littering, littering LinkedIn and Facebook and and Indeed and everywhere else. So, so always worth having a look and and seeing what the options are. Excellent. Okay. And, and uh, so moving to our third topic, third area then, is that, okay, you've found mm -hmm. yourself on the bad end of some some practices that doesn't quite, you know, fit with your values or you think, actually, do you know what, I'm getting tired. I, I'm, I'm beginning to miss out on things. And my, um, I'm not really getting trained. So you're, you're starting to identify some issues there. How do you raise that? I mean, how do you raise it and where do you raise it? Or, you know, I mean, what's the difficulty in raising some sort of um, perceived at this point exploitation? I mean, ho hopefully, you know, you'll be in an environment where you've got uh, a manager who's pretty open and pretty happy to, to talk about your concerns anyway. Um, if you're if you're lower down, if you're a consultant or, or an assistant, you probably have a line manager that you go to. If, if you're a bit more senior than that, then it's something you depending on the, upon the size of the, the company and, and so on. It might be about going to the, you know, the, the director or the managing director and, and raising your concerns. But it's important that important that you do, because if you've identified a problem, it's ultimately not just good for you to resolve it, but it's good for the company to resolve it as well. So it's probably best not to view it if you've identified gaps in training or um, problems with fatigue or morale or anything like that. The company is going to want to know about that. They're going to need to put that to right because the, at the end of the day, with with you know demand for ecologists we'll discuss being so high, the last thing they want to want to do is start to 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 bleed out you know staff. And 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 not be able to recruit because of, of the demands of the the industry. So definitely, um, you know, do do raise it. Um, obviously, make sure you go to the right chain up, um, and 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 set out your concerns. Probably write them down so that when you sit down with them and and, and talk to them, you've got those sort of bullet points, making sure you cover it all up. Because I can imagine for some people it's quite daunting, and you, it'd be you'd be very nervous at that point. You've plucked up the courage to say that you've identified a problem it needs resolving mm. and just makes you've got everything set out in front of you and that and that you said it all I, I, it'll, it will almost certainly be appreciated if it's not appreciated then you, yeah, yeah go somewhere else because you're not in, you're not in the right place if do, it's not appreciated you know i am i am so glad you said that i am really you know you know because it, it, you know uh, the likes of yourself and and and, and, and me we, we'd be mortified if we thought we were exploiting someone Mm. You know, and it could be something that we you know. Again, we're going to talk about those unknowns. You know, we, you know, it could be that we thought, you know, assumed incorrectly by the sounds of it, that this person enjoyed doing bad emergent surveys when actually they they despise it. You know, or yeah. they don't really get on with it. You know, for whatever reason, you know, and they brought to our attention. I'm bigger. Oh, you know, it, it is something that. You're right. It may seem daunting to the individual, but we really will benefit from those conversations. And um, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I absolutely echo your sentiment for that. Really. I, I, I don't know if it's a British thing. I think we're renowned for being bottlers sometimes, aren't mm, we? We bottle, mm. bottle things up, hold on to them, and, and we don't uh, express our kind of our feelings and, and thoughts enough. And, and we need people just to be really, really candid and, and um you know, being open and, and frank is is better for for everyone. Because I think what also, I mean, just think of it from the the person's, you know, the individual's point of view there. So they may be worrying about, oh, if I raise this, I may, you know, I I, I run risk of actually being, you know, fired or something like that, or mm -hmm. um, actually it's just it's just me. So they sit quietly, or maybe even you, you know leave, you know, they they leave the company to go into another company and make sort of the same errors again. So it's mm. like, oh, this happens with, and all of a sudden they've got this opinion that all consultancies are the same. They they all exploit me, and 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 it's really detrimental. I'm going to leave the I'm going to leave the whole industry completely. When actually, all it may take is for them to say, do you know what? I'm not comfortable doing this, and things may change. It may change them as an individual because they've spoken up and. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I think. I, what, 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 have you found that at all, or do you, what do you consider about that uh, aspect? I, I think. I mean, 
yeah, we, we, we've, we've talked about it. There, there is a risk. You, you could go somewhere new and, and, and have the same same problem and you come up with this false perception that, that everyone's the same. And so I, I, I've spoken to two or three people who have gone from very similar companies, structurally, size, scale, etc., and had the same problems where they were felt that the, the targets given to them were, were unrealistic. Uh, where they were pressured to undertake back to back. I mean, as recently as four or five years ago, mm. five back to back dust dawn mm. surveys nice. in a week. Mm. You know, th that's horrendous hours to have to work. Um, you know, asked to drive crazy distances or, or told that they're not being given overnight accommodation uh, or that they've got to be in Northumberland on, on the Monday and they've got to be in, in, in Sussex on the Tuesday or you know what I mean? Um, so, I think that look at look at the you know the variety uh, of, of options out there choices that there's some really good um, there are some really good good consultancy managers and and I was in a, a, a forum not too uh, long ago like a, a sort of an industry kind of get together talk about you know exploitation and a lot of companies set out their their policies and practices and things that they were doing to make sure that that staff were well cared for and there was some really good stuff. There was some really good stuff, and a lot of a lot of that has developed from feedback. Yeah, you know, it it's it, because what I experienced seventeen years ago, um, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't expect that to be the standard where I work now because that was seventeen years ago. Things have progressed and they, they've they've got better since then. Um, I kind of need other people to keep telling me what we can do that will make working conditions better and okay it's not like i'm going to do absolutely everything because you still got to pay the bills at the end of the day and you've got to run you know a company that 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 turns a profit but but yeah make sure that you are giving that feedback uh to you know because that that will just filter through and it'll it'll go up to management and hopefully things will get better okay so i mean that stems uh, okay that continues then about um Okay, so you know you've you've written things down. You've actually you know you, you've got it in your head what you're going to say to your line manager. Um, your line managers want to know. They don't want to know. I mean, in one way, clearly alarm bells are ringing at this point. No one mm. wants to know. There's a lot of red lot of red flags going up here. Uh, okay, your line manager doesn't want to know. You, okay, you've gone above them and you've gone to say the managing director. They don't want to know. Okay, what should happen next? Do you think? I, you, you've got to look and start looking elsewhere. You know, you, you're you're in the wrong you're in the wrong employment if you've if you've got management leading upwards that that isn't interested in in your problems, whether they're work related or whether they're personal, um, then 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 they're not a good employer. You, you've yeah, you, you've just got to look elsewhere. Unfortunately, like I said, we don't we don't have uh, we don't have unions yet that, that, that provide cover for ecologists. Yeah. Um, you know, even as an employer, I wouldn't mind seeing that happen. Um, you know, but um, but but yeah. Until then, you, you've got to be the decision maker there, and you've got to you've got to you've got to be prepared to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I think so too. I think it's um, it's when it's, it's sometimes you know, people hang on for too long. You know, they, mm. they you know when is the when is the right time to leave? Well, there's potentially no right time to leave, but you know certainly if you if you're experiencing something that's detrimental to a your you know your health your you know uh, uh, whether that be you know your physical health or uh, you know your your mental well-being you know well-being in general should I say um, you know people say oh what's what what's the likelihood of it's going to happen in my in the, the other company I'm looking at and I think something I've I've heard which has really really helped me you know, to grasp this is that um, okay. So, if you stayed at this company, what what's the percentage that things will change? Well, it's zero, you know, people go well, zero percent. You know, it's going to be exactly the same. I feel exactly the same position. Okay, well, if you jump ship, what's the likelihood of um, you know that company being the same? Well, I don't know. I mean, it could be, you know, it, you know, it could be fifty fifty. I, I really don't know. Well, instantly, you're fifty percent better off <laughs> yeah. going to that company. Because there's zero chance of you enjoying or being anything changing in that company, there's at least fifty percent change and possibility. Possibility is going to be better. Yeah. So uh, I think yeah, and, and and as we said, you know, go into that interview prepared with questions. Mm. You can explain. You can explain what the problem was at your previous consultancy. You know, are they? Were they? I, I was only being given five hours sleep a night because I was expected to to perform these dust dawn surveys, and 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 I, you know, I was suffering burnout and. and 
if they say, well, what was the problem with that? Well, you know, <laughs> they're not right for you. If they say, well, actually, our policy is you can only do three, uh, two or three, uh, you know, on social hours surveys a week. We never do a, a dawn after a dusk for, for any member of staff because we don't think it's safe. Well, instantly, your problem's your problem's resolved, isn't it? Yeah. Your biggest problem with that consultancy is resolved. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I suppose... I suppose a little bit more to add to that. I suppose you know, if if your line manager and your manager director don't you know aren't aren't responding, depending on the person, and uh, I you know I, I think that also but could could potentially be you know that that potential could potentially seek some legal advice. Yeah, yeah. I, I think legal advice, whether that you know obviously you know through a solicitor, uh, uh, or maybe even raising it to the industry, you know, Saeem directly as well. Yeah, citizens' advice is is always an option. You you can take a copy of your contract with you, uh, and point out um, or, or try and go with some evidence. You know, uh, keep a diary of the hours you're being told you've got to work. Keep take a couple of you know a copy of some emails perhaps where you you've had unnecessary you know pressure applied to you to mm-hmm. to work extra hours. Um, and 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 take that legal advice if if you feel. I mean, like I said, I mean a, a little bit. If these problems are, are, are growing, the, the first step is to try and resolve them and, and point out the problem. Um, and and if it's easier to to very quickly find easy you know employment elsewhere, mm-hmm. that again might be a better option for you. But certainly look at your your legal options if if you feel aggrieved and that, that you feel you haven't um, you know you haven't been treated fairly outside of, of the commitments for your your contract. And yes, speak to to speak to Sim. Um, obviously, you need to be a member, so do sign up. Please, yes, right. and, <laughs> um, I, but again, they're, they're not a union. They can provide you with a lot of advice, and they provide uh, mental health support as well. So, um, it, it's it, it is very well worth being a member. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, I think in terms of, I suppose, it's summarising some of those signs of exploitation. I think we, you know, we, what you've mentioned is, you know, being required to work overtime without pay not being given opportunities for growth and advancement in training and development, feeling overworked and undervalued, uh, for instance, you know, not, not getting that promotion that you think you should, you, you actually, you know, you know you deserve, not being in credit, not even being given credit for your ideas and work. Maybe those are actually, you know, someone else takes those off you as well. We, I know we didn't fo- fully touch off that, but, you know, it's like, I know it's not, you know, intellectual property IP, but, you know, if you've come up with a good idea and it's someone else has taken that, and they've used it to their advantage. Clearly, you've been disadvantaged by that and exploited mm. in that way. Um, now, Paul, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you so much uh, for, for today. And uh, um, now, I, I think I, I think what I'd like to do is just summarise, if I can, um, some of that point. I think from our conversation today. So, just just little, little bullet points that I think people can take away. And maybe to arm themselves, either they before they become an ecologist and know what to look out for, or they're in ecological consultancy already, or any, or a company already, an environmental company, something they could actually you know w- w- work towards and also recognise. So, I mean, um, yeah, what I've come up with uh, our conversation is today is that first of all, understand what you value from your career. Okay, so as I say, we talked about, um, I think um, some people may find long hours not, not too much of an issue and they can find that. But what's your value? What do you hold most important? Is your career flexibility and so forth? Why are you doing it? Depending on your reasons. There may be some trade-offs, for instance, that you're willing to make and to, to, uh, to about that threshold. I think the second we, point you mentioned was about doing your research. You know, research into other companies, online research, ask questions or seek answers about the company or organization you're looking to work for. Try, to, I mean, try to talk to the, you know, employees, existing employees, maybe previous employees if you can, to make sure the role's right for you. And brilliantly, yeah, yeah I think what I really took away, Paul, was um, asking those questions at the interview stage. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, don't be, don't be, don't be frightened to do that. Um, Briefly, we talked about finding your own career path. You know, if you if you do find yourself exploited, maybe time to j- move on. And you know, if there's no c- job advertised, maybe look. Yeah, you know, do do your own research and actually contact a few people. And finally, reporting, maybe even inaccurate advertising or mistreatment. Um, so, if you've done your research and you experience 
and you find out actually what was said on the tin doesn't actually match to what's actually inside and in your experience of it maybe you should be also um, you know, raising that um, to within the company itself have a voice um, uh, raise it to the, the, you know your line manager or maybe a bit further up seek legal advice or maybe report it to Siam if you're a member as well I, mean, I think I've, is that accurate accurate summary anything to add there at all no, I think that's a really good summary. Yeah, it's a really good summary. I mean, Sime can't discipline organisations because it's a members-based, yeah. uh, you know, body. Um, but certainly, I mean, there there are you know things that certain members uh, could do that breaches their code of conduct, and then that could lead to disciplinary action if if, if you know if someone has been abusive. Um, so it, it, that definitely speak to to Sime and, and and make sure you've yeah you, you're a member before. <laughs> You remember as well. It does give you an extra layer of protection. Absolutely. And I think it's also worth mentioning, as you did say, that what we're talking about, it's only the small percentage of people. And it really is. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it, most jobs will be pleasant. You'll learn a lot. Um, I, 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 I hope that generally that there is a lot more investment uh, in early career colleges. It doesn't come cheaply. That's why it's been avoided. You know, it, it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of time to to sort of take people on shadowed experience, send them away in training courses, and and you know online learning and reading good practice guidelines and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a lot to learn in those first two years, but it will if you're an employer and you're listening, it will pay cracking dividends. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my first employee, uh, Sam, he's still with me 10 years later. He's an assistant manager and, and, and a really valuable um, asset to the company. Um, that's what that's what that's what we all need. We all need, um, you know, more seniors, more principals and uh, um, helping us along uh, to lighten our own our own workloads. Right. So, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think sometimes employers fear. And you know, I've heard this mentioned, actually, that, uh, uh, you know, but if I train them, they'll leave. <laughs> and I think, well, uh, yeah, but if you train them really well, you know, if you train them really well, they won't leave. <laughs> Some, why would someone who feels well supported yeah. leave? You yeah, know, exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, yeah, yes, yes. Well, uh, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today, and uh, thank you for um, your time um, and, and also your expertise. You know that, that you know, the, the obviously the article you wrote for it was it, was it on LinkedIn or was it actually in Siam itself? And Marcus Kohler it was, wrote it. It was on Siam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so very yeah so yeah also there's another article by, I have to mention Marcus Kohler because he did write a, a really good article as well he did yes yeah. I referenced it I referenced there it there we yeah. go exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> so Marcus thank you <laughs> uh, but no thank you for your time Paul uh, today uh, wish you uh, the best for the, the oncoming season uh, as well but um, thank you very much uh, for now thank you for joining me on the Ecology Academy podcast thank you I've enjoyed it if you enjoy our show and want to help then please click on the subscribe button and rate us on your favourite podcast player. As that's how you can inspire ecologists in the making, help retain great talent and provide insights of our industry to a much wider audience of why ecology really does matter. Thank you. And remember, learning is a lifelong endeavour. So stay curious, be adventurous and build bridges for others to cross. 